first question is from DeLorean62. And she asks, hey, Sam, I was wondering. Sorry. Christ, OK. Lost somebody else. Another <laughs> episode of Building a Dark Web, episode 1.2, where we are going to be discussing chapter two of Dark Web, the Amazon Prime series that was just nominated for seven Emmys. Woo! Woo! We're excited about that. We're going to stop talking about that. Um, so I'll introduce everybody. We have Rob Goki, composer extraordinaire. Everybody did the score for Hacked, which is in uh, as a, the anthology segment of Chapter Two. We have Lana McKissick, who Hello. played Sam Daniels on the show, who was introduced in episode or Chapter Two. We have once again Mario Michoni, right. writer, director, graphic artist extraordinaire, uh, producer. What else do you do? Uh, everything. A little magic. Everything. Magic. He's a, stri he's a stripper. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. However you pay the bills in this industry. I love it. And we have, once again, joining us from last episode, Ro Roxy She. Hi. Happy to be back. He directed all of the A story, which was a crazy feat, as well as Eat, Pray, Love, which we'll talk about in, in 1.5 of building. I feel like I'm Michelle Visage right now. Like you're like RuPaul <laughs> and you're like, Michelle, I'm like, ah, I'm back. Did that make me Carson? <laughs> yes. <Or Rob. laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Suck it. We um, keep losing my that. brother, Tim Nardelli, but he is a co-creator of the show. He's in a dark basement right now. He'll pop back up any minute now. We have Eric Salberg who directed Hacked, which is the anthology segment in chapter two. And he also served many a role on Dark Web. He has some cameos in there. Um, tell, tell everybody, introduce yourself, tell us what else you did on Dark Web. Hello, a lot. I'm Eric. I directed Hacked in episode two. And I production managed this whole show with you guys. Every single chapter. <laughs> Yeah, and it was fun. And you were there from the beginning. I was there from pre-pro. I was at that table reading everything. Yeah. So you you went on the whole dark journey with us. I so, did. So uh, I don't know where Tim is, but hopefully he's coming back. So for context, we're still filming this during a pandemic. In case you're watching this uh, 20 years from now, I'm wondering why. Yeah, because all the in the pandemic. Wondering why Michael is in outer space. Oh, God, I meant to turn it off, I meant to turn it off. Yeah, wondering why I have, I'm in outer space with a ring light. Uh, let me turn this off. And wondering why we're all in our pajamas and look tired and haggard. Um, and we're also, we should say, recording this on June 19th, which is Juneteenth, which I wanted to acknowledge. Um, it's just the official end of slavery in the United States, the Civil War, 1865. And we had a lot of great black talent that worked on the show actors, actresses from the screen, behind the screen. Um, two of whom are in tonight's episode, uh, Navarra Starson, who's a friend of mine, and Isis King, and they're fantastic. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and everything that the movement that's happening right now. And I thought we could all acknowledge it. How Make it be the national holiday. Yes, yeah, it, agree. We, by the time you're listening to this, hopefully it is a national holiday and we hear you and we see you and we support you and we are grateful for all the, the black talent and lucky to have all the black talent work in dark web. Are we talking to the future? We are we talking to the future us? You have to assume that we are. <laughs> all right. And anybody else who wants to chime in on that, uh, hopefully I used the right words. I just wanted to express my gratitude. 
Yes, I agree with everything you said. Happy Juneteenth. Um, uh, proud to be alive during this time and excited for progress to come as quickly as possible. Okay, and with no further ado, we will start talking about dark web. And I just, Tim, are you back? Okay. Yeah, sorry, everyone. Yeah. Oh, and he's got yeah. more light too. He's got Ooh. more light. Okay. okay. So as was last week, we'll start with uh, Roxy. Well, well, great, let's do it. <laughs> You're on call. What was the hardest part about, okay, so this, from what I recall, was our first day yes. of shooting. First day of shooting. Yes. And uh, luckily, it involved one actress, the very talented and prepared and professional Lana, who I remember running lines with you on that first day. That was fun. Um, yeah. What was the hardest part about this shoot? Uh, well, this was the very first day, so I think that, like, um, with many productions, your first day really sets the tone for how the rest of the shoot is going to go. And so we wanted to take things off running. Like, I remember, um, Michael, you brought donuts for us on the very first day. Like, there's just so many things that I think producers can, like, you know, do, like, small things that'll really boost morale for cast and crew on the very first day, and that was exactly what happened. I remembered we had, like, a 13 and a half page shoot. Uh, Lana had to fucking really riff off everything. Like, she had to perform. She didn't, she wasn't on cocaine with teeth, but, like, like she was, you know, because we also had a company move this day. We had to go and pick up um, Sibos, uh, yeah, yeah uh, Sibongale's, uh, her, her, her cafe, a shot for the montage for episode five. Like we had to go do that on this day as well. So I think for me, the most hectic thing was, okay, how do we get the show off on the right foot? How do we propel it and make sure that we make our day on the very first day? Because there was very little contingency or um, space for us to fuck up on this day. So then, um, Lana brought her A game. Like she was just so on top of it, like so funny, so vibrant, so energetic, and like was really just so responsive with everything. Like I was, I don't know Lana what what it was like for you to work with me on that very first day, but I remember we'll just keep going and like I'll just throw a note at you really quickly in the middle of the take and you just have to like bounce back really quickly to do exactly that. Like I don't know what your process was like, if that was something that you've always been used to, you know, like being on your feet like that or what that was like. Sorry, honey, I'm like hijacking it because I actually want to know what Lama's experience is like working on this first day with me in that sense. No, I do too. So, so before you answer, real can if uh, someone's talking for a while, let's go on mute because I'm hearing uh, echo, echo and stuff. Um, so um, Lana, it's your time to monologue. So we'll go on mute while you talk. And hey, I want, like Roxy said, I want to know like what your first day was like. You were like walking into the lines. Then was it crazy? Um, did you feel pressure that it was the first day? Um, let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I mean, to me, it's always like the first day of school where you, you don't sleep that well the night before because you're just excited and a little scared and you're like, I don't know what it's going to be, what's going to happen. Am I going to get fired? Um, so many questions. Um, I didn't get fired, which was great. But uh, yeah, it was especially daunting because of the amount we had to do for sure. Um, Cause you know, typically you just do like a couple pages and you're really drilling those pages. Uh, because it was the first day, I actually felt like I, as far as memorizing, I had more time because it wasn't like, you know, we'd been shooting all that day and then the next day I had to prepare another 17 pages or whatever. It was like I had however long it was before we started shooting to prepare. So that was good. It was really fun. Um, yeah, no, I love being thrown stuff. I mean, I had worked with Roxy, but she was the first AD on the first assistant director on a different film. Um, and she was awesome. And she, it, it, you're very different in different like roles. It's funny. Cause you are, you know, as an, as an AD, you were like the perfect AD, like on top of it, like, but very serious, very like, I was like, Oh shit. Like, don't, okay. Like nobody be late. Nobody screw up. Um, still very fun and a joy to be around, but like definitely like a different, energy and then here you were like still on top of it we still made our days everything was great but you were also like okay let's try this and what i love about working with you is you always have a really specific uh goal in mind like i never feel like you're going oh i don't really know let's just give me something different 
which sometimes people say and sometimes that works out, but you were like, okay, great. Let's try that only this time. You know, every, every note was specific. There was no wasted time. Um, so I had an absolute blast. I thought it was so much fun. I thought the whole shoot was like that. It was just a, a joyous group of people who got along and enjoyed each other um, and then never spoke again. <laughs> That's such a lie. <laughs> That's such a lie. I mean, like just today I was going on Instagram stories, you guys, and then I saw that, you know, we did like our announcement for Comic-Con. Dude, that was like a year ago. It was a year ago today. Fuck. No, like Comic Con or that we announced. It it. We announced it. But it was Mario, you said that the other day. It was a year ago today. And the, the show came out a year ago today. No, no. The show came out July 19th. Okay. Yeah. The show came yeah. out in July. They're going to be announced. I know. It all blurs together. The Emmys, the Emmys, six of the Emmys will be announced one year to the day when we release. That's it. what it was that you said the other day. Oh, my God. You God. guys, the world has changed so fucking much since that time. Like, no. like a million years ago. We were yeah. all together in one room celebrating. Yeah. And so many going. people in one room. Yeah. yeah. Sharing food. Probably. Yeah. What? No. <laughs> yes, we were. You know, you can't help but look back at photos like when we were at Comic Con and what little we knew what was coming. Little yeah. did we know. So, Lana, mm -hmm. um, I want to know was there anything, uh, any specific inspiration for Sam other than I think yourself inspired her a little bit or she inspired How you? How dare you? And I'm not going to train all of my happiness. You have, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. You, you have a history uh, of, you know, a YouTube uh, presence. As, yeah. This is Sam. Um, so I think you had that to draw upon, but were there other things? <laughs> and you told okay. me that, that Sam inspired you since in your, in your, uh, so, your life on social media, you know, post-show. True, true. <laughs> um, yes, no, I did have a history of, of making social media content. I was a YouTube creator for a few years, um, and then I also have a history of being an asshole, so that was helpful, too. Um, now, Sam is very, it's funny, because at the beginning, I feel like the whole first episode, you're like, this person sucks, like, she's so self-obsessed, like, who is this, but, you know, and she says some not great things to people who are her friends. Um, but I think, you know, eventually you start to see like, okay, she just, she's got all these walls up because, you know, when you have a million people sending you messages saying like, I hope you die and you're a slut and you're fat and you're ugly and like whatever else people say online to make people feel bad, uh, you know, you have to develop walls and have to be a little more, uh, I don't know, prickly. Maybe you don't have to, but that's how Sam was. Um, I don't think I'm like that. I think uh, I just get hurt every time someone says something mean to me and I never get used to it. So that's healthy. Um, I think I'm, I, yeah, I've, as far as carrying her with me now, I think I'm a little more careful about the internet since dark web came out because I'm like, I didn't realize a lot of these things were real. Of course I heard crazy horror stories but for somebody who puts herself out there all the time like Sam does you're opening yourself up to you know crazy things like like having your body parts auctioned off online perhaps oh my god um or you know just and just you know I think I talked about this at Comic-Con, but I have a friend who's um, known on the internet and somebody found his house and like showed up at his house because she was like, oh, I recognized your front door. And I was like, okay, that's terrifying. So um, it's terrifying. And in that sense, I think, you know, Sam has taught me to be a little more reserved. Put everything out there. You just never know who's watching. I just want to point out that like, while we were editing this, or uh, like I want to say it was six or seven months after we shot there was an article released about a guy who had literally kidnapped uh, some model in in the UK and was auctioning her off on Instagram and I remember when I read that I was like 
oh, this is, this is real. This just, this just became super real. And yeah, it was super unsettling. Could you please put the camera closer, please? <laughs> yeah, I agree. So as far as being like Sam, I think I'm less so because I'm, I'm very cognizant of what I allow people to see. Tim tried to auction me on the internet and nobody would pay. <laughs> what? I got five on it. You know what you did? Yeah, I mean, I'll pay. Jeez. I got five on it. All right, well, let's go. Come on. Thanks. Where were you? Hey, 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 hold on a sec. Oh. If you're going to throw me under the bus, why don't you tell them that story where you were trying to fight getting a parking ticket or a speeding ticket and you said you had a twin brother and you blamed it on me? <gasps> no, I said I wasn't sure that it was me. <laughs> Oh, oh, don't play Mr. Innocent. You threw me under the bus. The judge had heard that one before, and he was not having it. And I lost that case. Okay. So, yeah, I, I want to know, so as you mentioned, you were UPM. You, you rose up, you campaigned to direct this segment. Uh, what attracted you to it? What was the biggest difference between... Uh, working on the show, you know, for months as UPM and then, uh, you know, not graduating to director, but transitioning into the other role of, you know, auteur, director. Of um, well, firstly, as far as like the transition went, it was, it was kind of difficult to like take off the logistics hat. And I remember, um, you know, like Lindy and uh, Allison and, you know, all you guys basically telling me like, hey, like, don't worry about certain things anymore because it got to a point where I was, you know, I was also PMing my own episodes. So I was like trying to balance, you know, the wearing the production management hat and then the directing hat, which is totally two different Eric's in my opinion, um, where like, you know, one of me is going to be all business and the other one's all smiles because I'm, you know, creating or wearing the creativity hat. Um, as far as, hacked goes in general um you know when you guys had first talked to me about hacked it was a different it was a different script so it was for me it was super awesome and not a challenge it was a challenge to like you know make this story more dark web friendly if if you will even though it's totally unfriendly and so you know i don't know if you guys remember but the the way it was written was a little different in the sense of it was uh so it, at first it was supposed to be somebody who was stalking her and so to take it and i, w I wish chris was was on this was on this call um because i haven't actually talked i haven't actually talked to him but uh so chris wrote it in the way where it was you know somebody physically stalking cassie the entire episode and i had just sort of changed it to like the internet we never know who it is who's actually watching her but it's the web and which in my opinion is way freakier as we see and know that, you know, our phones and our laptops and our, you know, cameras are always watching. Um, so, yeah, but it was, uh, at first, like I said, it was just challenging to take off the logistics hat and then put on the creative hat. Well, so, but Lana mentioned that Roxy acts different in her different roles as, I think, AD and director, right? Was that, you were comparing her? her you were but, but actually, Roxy, do you agree with that or do you feel like you're the same? Sorry to interrupt quickly. No, I actually think that um, you have to know what your role is. So it's like, what, whatever position it is, yeah, the switching hats is very difficult, Eric, and I, I totally uh, resonate with that. But it's like, okay, if this is what it is, and this is what my responsibilities are, and you just have to do your best to like, shut it out, you know? Right. Because like, okay, as a director, I'm like, I'm here for my actors, I'm here with my producers and my writers, and I'm here to do this job specifically, and I can't worry about anything else, you know? Yeah. Um, and also I think that like, as indie filmmakers, you tend to have to wear a lot of different hats, but like, as you start to make more, you realize the importance of like, really knowing what your role is. And even though you're in the same group of people, you know, and it's hard navigating that, it's like, okay, when this is, when this hat is on, then I'm this, you know? So um, yeah, it's like, as an AD, <laughs> That was the only movie I've ever AD'd, and it gave me so much fucking stress. I'm like, I will never AD anything no, ever again. You AD'd that short that I did, that I was on Medina. Didn't you AD that? 
the horror, the the horror, the chops or the. What did I did? I don't know. That was like really small and fun though. I was like, that was like, you know, but 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 Lana was talking about a feature, and I was just like, what am I doing? You were great though. You really were. You were so like. Thank you. And, yeah. Um. Sorry, Eric. I didn't mean to. Sorry. Eric. Curious. So, um, but for Eric, um, going back to hack, because I feel I well, I hope a lot of you know uh, like filmmakers maybe are watching this, wanting to learn, and I feel like uh, a lot of a lot of people ultimately want to direct and rise up through different you know ways. And so, how did being how does how does being a UPM prepare you? Uh, like, what skills came in handy when you were directing, or vice versa? Like, how did the two roles complement each other? Each other, and would you learn from each? take back to the other one i would say that wearing different hats on film sets will help you as a director when it comes to devising your shots and knowing you know what your day is going to look like in the sense of uh you can be a little bit more realistic about what you want to do creatively um and sometimes it's bad because by knowing the elements of what else it takes to get a certain shot, it might get in the way of your creativity. So it's, it's still at the end of the day, like, you know, like Roxy says, like you, you got to shut it off and, and let yourself be that position. So even though it does help you, absolutely. Like I've been basically in every single role on a film set. I, you know, I started out producing short films when I was in college and eventually was a carpenter building sets in Chicago at Cinespace and working in the grip department and working as a production manager and an AD and a director. And so all those things help me when it comes to like actually knowing how to talk to departments, I think is the best way that it helps a director because I can communicate what I want exactly to not just my DP and not just my producers, but I can communicate what I want down to my gaffer and know what I'm talking about. And so that's what I would say, like for any directors, wearing the other hats and roles and, and experiencing them is gonna make you become like, not necessarily a better filmmaker, but you can definitely be more, um, I don't know, like y you'll, you'll be able to hone in on your craft a little bit more. And, and as an indie filmmaker, you'll be able to be a little bit more realistic about the films that you wanna make but at but again at the end of the day like when you're directing you, sh you really should try to turn off every other aspect of it and and focus in on your creativity because if you're letting like the some other department world get in your brain then you're going to clog creativity and that's going to communicate from you to your actors or you to your dp so it you know it helps in it it helps in a lot of ways but also if you want to direct, then, you know, focus on that. When you are directing, wear that hat. Yeah, no, it's, it's good because I think we all, like, you know, we talk about it being an indie show that we all made, you know, on our own, <laughs> more or less, without, like, some greater or larger entity helping us or guiding us. So we all did have to take on, like, five different roles. Yeah, like no, that. we totally busted our asses for everything that we got. Like, it, and that's what I think you know, anyone who could critique our show you know, a lot of people who see it, they don't understand, you know, people don't, under a lot of people don't understand what necessarily goes into filmmaking and let alone indie filmmaking. And those of you that do can watch Dark Web and be like, holy shit, these guys did it by themselves. And, and you, you, you can see all of our names, you know, on everything, not because we're, we wanted to necessarily be that proud and make ourselves those roles, but it was because we, we had to do it, right? So you just gotta do what you gotta do to get it done. And we did it.
after all the blood was shed and the tears were cried, the episode uh, landed on Rob Goki's desk. And uh, so, Roberto, uh, we're gonna talk about the, the, the score, the cues that you came up with were hacked. What? Yeah. I, the generic I down, what inspired him? I think I sat down with, with um, both Mario and Eric and we talked about tone and like what they were looking for in terms of the score. And this is an interesting project because it's an anthology and there's a composer doing the main story, which would, and there's like a, an extra beginning and end to, to the episode. So we had to make sure that the scores didn't work so contrasting. They, it didn't make sense and felt like it didn't all fit together. Um, as opposed to having like an all encompassing project where there's just one voice. Um, so I, one thing I liked about the score is it went from lighter to darker as the episode went on, um, like the story did. Like, you know, in the beginning, um, the whole tone is much lighter. Even when she's sad, sitting in the, you know, at, at work and seeing the drive through, um, the music is not as, I, I thought about this, the turning point is the shower scene where we start off a little bit lighter and then as the phone's going off on its own, the music gets darker and it just goes, like this, all the way to the end of the episode, all the way through the line. All the all the shower scene. <laughs> dun dun dun! I was on mute. Sorry. And what? So uh, I, because I love uh, score and everything. I think it, we uh, Mario and I were uh, on the phone, and um, the gentleman who composed all the the A story score today. Um, he had an interview with uh, an on, like an online music aficionado group. And uh, we, we were saying like, they were asking what our favorite moment of production everything was. And I was like, I don't know. And I was like, you know what, honestly, like when you sit with the composer and the music comes in, like you've spent all that time editing, but it really like gels when you have the, the score. Comes in. You're like, oh, whoa, it's like a real go now. Because it's like the second to last point before the sound mix. It's the point where you're finally like, instead of all these pieces, you're like, oh, we're getting to the point where my vision, like we're actually getting close to where it needs to be to be a finished film. Like it's one step from being, at least audio wise, it's one step from being done. Yeah, um, it's something kind of about exciting because you're like, oh my God, there's a finish line. <laughs> but more, I don't know. There's, I think more than just being like further along, it's like the score really can elevate. Um, yeah, I think music is so important or lack of music, like sort of sound design is so important in a film. You know, there's always, for me, and this is something we were talking about earlier today, you know, when you put a film together and you review it, there's that moment, like the first time you watch something with all of the sound and all of the music where it just clicks that like, this is what you kind of envision this project to be and if now it's real, that's always very satisfying. And I think music is a huge part of that. Like the music, it can totally make or break something. Like it's, you know, if you think about your most, the, the most sort of evocative scenes in cinema, you know, sound and what they did with the music or lack of music or sound design, that, you know, you take that out and I bet you, you don't get to have, you don't have the same reaction in those scenes. Like the, it's, it's very important how something sounds in filmmaking. And so you, it's always hard to judge a product before you have, you know, you have everything in there. And so, yeah, it's always, it, that, that moment is always the best moment. So what are your, some of your favorite um, scores or composers and did any of those bleed into or influence your work on Hacked? Um, that's a good question. I mean, some of my favorite composers are Brian Tyler, who has done like a million different films, but I remember hearing him when he was doing Fast and Furious before he started doing Avenger films. And he's very versatile in, styles and I love Bear McCreary who did Walking Dead and um, Ages of S.H.I.E.L.D. and um, Battlestar Galactica which is amazing score um, but I also like I, I feel like I took some influence from Charlie Clauser and Saw um, because his score even though this isn't straight horror um, there are like horrific elements to to hack and so his he has a great ear for sound design and mixing the sound design and the score together so that it feels like it's kind of all in one. And do you have a favorite piece in this episode? Like, is there one scene that you, I know um, a little bit. We definitely had some retro 80s, like. 
Yeah, you know what? I I kind of like the like the the flute the the flute yeah. that comes in over like the shower scene, and then it comes back at the very end as she's about to get hacked. That was um, my favorite part too. What what'd you call it? Was a special uh, specific kind of flute, right? Um, yeah, it was. Well, it was a Japanese flute, and and it's funny because I used it. I thought it it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, this sounds good here. Let me just throw it in, and then everybody loved it, and I was like, oh yeah, I picked that on purpose. <laughs> so, like that was the perfect. It was one of those things where I picked my ear and I thought what would fit here that's not going to that's not going to stand out but it's going to enhance what we've got and I and when I call back to it later in the score um, I feel like that's the moment where everything turns and then at the very end when it comes back in is you know the final moment. And do you think um, if you you know because we've been talking about how we made the show and everything was like lean and mean and quick and multitasking now that it's been a year or some is there anything you would do differently or do you think if you had more time it'd be different? there is all like everything i've ever worked on there's always something i would do differently it's I w i'm always horrible at any kind of premiere because and i'm sure this happens with actors and with directors and with editors you sit there and while you're sitting with the audience and you're supposed to be like enjoying the moment of viewing it with people instead you're like oh why did i pick that Oh, that could have been, that should have been this way. Oh, if I change that to this. And so you, like, I tend to just kind of pick it apart. So I almost need the director and the producers to go, this is great. We're, we're really happy with this. Stop here because, you know, I'll just keep going. It's like painting a picture. I'll just keep going and keep going if I, if there's not a stopping point. Um, that said, I'm really happy. And I, I listened to it again recently. I'm really happy with the way that it came out. Um, and I don't know that I would change anything. I feel like indie film is always like fast and no time um, and you're doing stuff like under the gun. And so it's just how, it's just how it works. And so you get used to it after a while. Yeah. And do you think score nowadays is better? Or, Cause there's a lot of debate. Like I watch a lot of YouTube videos where people, you know, complain that modern score isn't as kind of dynamic or um, signature sound means it used, it's, uh, you know, more generic these days. You, you know, the first couple I ever heard was John Williams and like, you know, I grew up with Star Wars and, and, and um, Raiders. And so all of those scores are very iconic. And when you think about like a theme that you can hum, and I know that there's less hummable themes, but as a composer, I feel like score writing is almost more fun now because it rides that line between sound design and score. And so you get to play with things a little bit more and experiment with weird instruments. Um, and so that, to me, balances out the loss of like a hummable theme or like a huge orchestral theme, because that's not really in right now is using like a hundred piece orchestra. Like the, ret the retro thing is like, has been in for a little while, but everybody wants something that sounds different or smaller. Smaller seems to be the new thing. Interesting. I wonder why. I like, I like big scores. Attention spans. Wow. <laughs> Speed, technology, speaking of the dark web. So now uh, we'll come back to you, Rob. More questions for Roxy and Eric. Um, one question that people might have watching it, especially, um, well, Roxy later in the shoot, but Eric had a lot of locations on this episode. Um, I'm like scrolling through it as we talk. There were, there were a lot of locations we had the apartment, we had the fast food place, we had a reshoot in my house, we had the, the kill room at the end. Anyway, so for people watching, and sometimes we had uh, 15 to 16 page days, how did you two make your days, but still maintain a, uh, you know, like a, a film level or TV level aesthetic? Who's gonna answer first? I'll let Roxy go. Oh, are we gonna rock, paper, is this for it? Let's rock your no, You already okay. won. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I come from the understanding that like the director sets the tone of the day. Like the moment you set up you step foot on set, everything trickles from the top down. So it's very important like how your attitude is and like what kind of energy you're putting on, you know, because everyone is going to respond to that. So I think what really gets me through the day is just having a lot of proper planning. Um, making sure you talk to your departments well ahead of time that your AD and you are on the same page, that you're well aware of what incrementals you're shooting on in terms of timeframes and everything so that 
you want to be able to have fun with your actors too like have some time to play around and to explore things and that's always the dream is to be able to you know because like even if you're the writer of a story there's things that you discover even more when you shoot it um so you always want to make time for that and so for me i got my experience um becoming a director by being a producer first and so i always like to look at what directors i shadowed to uh, take what aspects of them that i really liked and how they maximized their time and those directors who had ego trips and like you know because there's always this thing about like being a director and having power that's like so bullshit that like i never want to take with me and i encourage other people to not take as well like at the end of the day it is a job and you need to make sure you can make your day you could come in on budget i think that's like the one thing i would give to any emerging filmmaker that's watching this is that it is a job it is a privilege to be a director um and so when you're handed that responsibility it's important that you maximize that so the work is in the prep um you go in as prepared as possible so that um you and everybody else coming to set is on the same page and um and if so that should give you some room to play and if not, then at least you are able to accomplish what you prep for. I yield my time. Thank you. Okay, so what's the direct question? <laughs> the, the, in a nutshell, like, how'd you make your days? Because we had- Oh, much. yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll actually, I'll go off on a little tiny tangent. Um, so my days actually weren't terribly bad. Um, I know Roxy's were because she was trying to shoot a whole show in like less than 10 days. And yeah, um, mine were a little different. I do know that the roughest day was the, so it doesn't look this way, but we shot all of the, the restaurant stuff in one day. And um, we got over 70 setups and we made our day. We didn't go over time. Um, that being said, the, that was the roughest day because we spent half of a day on the first shot. Um, and then we somehow managed to get the rest of, you know, the pages in a half a day. And, um, and we thank Hanuman Brown and Eagle. Your DJ. Yeah. Yes. Uh, me and Hanu have been working together for about six years now. Um, and, me and him are have a very good ebb and flow. Um, what he likes about me is that I can tell him exactly what I want and even sometimes know how to light it or at least think I do. And then um, he pretty much just makes it look pretty for me. And, uh, but he's very active and he's very into the shot too. He's, he's not a DP who, you know, I have to guide all the time. He sometimes... Uh, because a lot, a lot of times people get very stuck in their specific roles or they just have been doing it long enough that they are that role. And, and sometimes it's nice to have somebody to give you a little bit of feedback. In, in my case, as a director, I like asking everybody I'm working with for feedback. And sometimes, sometimes it can be, in certain circumstances, you don't want to do that. But then in other times, it's nice to hear other people's feedback. And that's what I think gives the crew sort of a sense of, camaraderie and it keeps the morale up but um as far as making the days and, and the page numbers and the counts at the end of the day if you're going to call yourself a director and you want to be a director then you got to know what you want and that's a part of wearing the hat of being a director and you should know exactly what you want going in there and you need to get what you got to get and if you, you got to know how you got to get it and direct the people into doing it so it's not something where it's like you can base your directing off of oh well did I make my day it's like no did you get what you want did you get the shots that you needed because in your head you should know if you didn't get what you exactly thought you planned to do like let's say you have x amount of shots and you only and you got two less but you know you got what you need then you're good to go and so it's hard to to judge because some people don't make not everybody makes their days and it doesn't make them bad filmmakers it just it means that, you know, they, they might not need to, or, or maybe they're just not, you know, maybe something isn't working right. But, um, you know, making a 10 or 12 page day now is 
a lot easier than it, I think, used to be, than a, a lot of people, you know, think. But it's still rough, and it's a lot of pressure for not only directors, but actors and DPs. And it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. You guys both pulled off several mirrors making this one. And I actually learned from you, Roxy, when I was directing Viral, because um, you're moving so quick, you direct actors in take. So it's like you don't even stop to do another like startup or another take or no, you're just like, okay, no, 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 no drop back in and do this. Da, da, da. And I think it's great. Cause then you're just, you're already in the moment. And Lana, you can probably talk about it too. Cause I'm sure you, <laughs> sure you experienced it. Um, where like, you think you're done and she doesn't even call cut. You just keep going. And I kind of like it. You just, cause you're already there. You don't wait for everybody to yell cut and do makeup touch-ups and stuff. You just keep the train moving. You know, I, I think I was able to do that when I was like in the stage of dark web and the tribe. Like that's something that I implemented a lot. Nowadays, as when I direct, I can't do that anymore. Like I think I take more time to think and deliberate. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm evolving or maybe I'm deteriorating <laughs> one or the other or I'm just getting older. But you know, I think that back then, I think it was out of necessity and, and I was able to really pinpoint but but the bad thing about that is that like I like to watch the entire performance, you know, and let it sit. Um, but also the energy is different because I think that, that w with this stuff, a lot of it's like to webcam and like to themselves or like talking to other people. Like it was it was very like that. I'm able to do things intake. But when you're talking about like a dialogue between two actors or like the context of, of a scene. I think that is different now because I really want to be able to sit with it, digest it, and like really give proper notes, you know? But um, yeah, maybe I'm just different. But back then, like, I think I learned that from one director who was like really intense and he was really effective in doing it that way. So that was also a technique that I got from somebody else. You know, it wasn't something that I derived myself, but in, in really tight turnarounds and on indie budgets, like, yes, absolutely. If there's a way that you know exactly the note you're going to get, write it down. And as you're doing it, just pick it up right away, pick it up right away. So at least you have it for the edit, you know? Well, I think you had to on this because I think we talked about it last time too. We had feature film goals or TV goals. We had an indie, indie, indie film budget. And then we had like a soap opera schedule. Like the, the amount of pages per day is what people do on a soap. But you know, our aim was aesthetically to have it look bigger than a soap. And we had like location, you know, on location, um, company moves and all that stuff. So I think you had to do it that way. It was the only way to get through it. Um, all right, so Mario and Tim and more wine. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> drinking. I feel like it's terrible. I just stop. <laughs> it's the quarantine lifestyle, I guess. It is. But I, I love it. Yeah. Some, some, some aspects are, you know, tolerable. Uh, Mario. The last time I saw Roxy, I drank a full bottle of wine on Zoom. So. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> that is good. Yeah. In all your glory. <laughs> yes, you did. Well, hopefully we'll have more reasons to do that soon. I mean, you know, like fun reasons. Um, uh, anyway, Mario and Tim, uh, notes from the post production, because Mario, you were there in the shoot for the uh that's when he asked you not there on the shoot but you were all up in the post for this no, was one. all over post right. well i mean it post was particularly tricky Ugh. yes for this episode because sam has several computer monitors that she's working off of and she and she you know we made her very tech savvy and that she's sending things from her phone to monitors and she's working between all these monitors and so um, you know, we had to work with uh, Kyle, who was one of our graphic designers, and we designed like an interface for Sam's computer. Like, what would Sam's computer look like? What operating system would she use? What would her backgrounds be? That sort of thing. Um, and then we had to develop these different screens that played together, you know, so that, that, that she would be moving, you know, she would have some windows here and she would have some windows here, but they're all part of the same computer system. So it was sort of a nightmare, honestly, to kind of do all that and we always talk we talked a little bit in the last round table about um prepping screens in advance of shooting versus doing them in post you know which is really difficult but you know i think it all it all ends up being fine but yeah that was there were so many screens and it was like oh my god why did we do this yeah, I, I feel like oh sorry michael you go ahead. i was gonna say i feel like 
I don't, if you have like a behind the scenes thing, if you could just show how much you guys had to put in, because I, what I saw was a blank screen with like a couple tape marks here and there and like what you actually end up with in all of the episodes is just like a massive amount of, of stuff happening all over the place. And it's incredible the amount of work you did. Like it blows my mind. Yeah, we had a lot of really good designers and graphic artists. I mean, there are some shots in other episodes that, you know, that we were not sure how we were going to do. And we brought in some people who did them and we we're just like, like we, you saved us in post and you're never supposed to do that, but you totally did that. So yeah, it's, it was, we were really lucky. Episode two had uh, like some of the most random like uh pop oh, graphic too. Shots into like it was oh, like man. 80 something different graphics like and i i just remember in the world like, graphics yeah. that were like people walked in front of them it was it was a lot and let me tell you something so <laughs> the i making okay so we all had to like design the the social the the interface the app we based it mostly on instagram a little snapchat but what the biggest pain in the ass was, you guys remember? Track the app name? Well, okay, we talked, yeah, clearances, that was a pain. Originally it was gonna be... Um, it was supposed to be... Uh, what's it called originally? Uh, flash frame. Yeah, flash yeah, yeah, frame. flash frame, because and then, and that was... Because there is a flash frame. And then yeah. it has to be frame flash or something it's like that. Yeah. For the show. But the biggest pain in the ass from a continuity point uh, standpoint was tracking her followers. Oh my God. Because oh, yeah. Always oh, these little shit like that. Yeah, and she yeah. gains and loses followers throughout. So it's like you get away with it a little bit. But there was one when she's standing by the thing. I just remember like we cut away, we cut back, we cut away, cut back. And when we were approving the effects, the follower count was different each one. And it was just like, you know, you, you could just let it go, but from like a perfectionistic, you know, there's gonna be one person out there that's like, wait, in the last shot, she had, you know, that many followers. And it was a drastic amount where it was like, you, couldn't really, you wouldn't be able to buy it that she lost that many or gained that many within a couple seconds. So um, what's my moral here? My, my moral is, just you gotta, you gotta really pay attention to stupid little things like continuity. Like if, you know, where a window is on a screen in one shot, like that can't change drastically, you know, between shots. Like what we would, what we did for, basically what I did for Sam's screens and I did, we did it for all the screens is that I sat down with Kyle and I just said, look, here's a timeline of what Sam does. She opens up this email, she opens up this, she clicks this link, it scans a virus. And he would, he would deliver like, a minute animation of a, of a screen doing that, right? And then we would break up the pieces to go in, you know, shot one, shot two, shot three, and we would give each piece to the graphic designer, you know? And so then you would get it in there and it would mostly work, but you would notice little weird things that weren't working and you'd have to go back and get tweaks and, you know, it's just very tedious, but. And it was um, Lana's segment, I think, where we finally just abandoned the idea of filming the clothes, uh, cause we went and did like pickups of monitors uh, yeah, for her and for Brian's stuff, and that was when we finally just a, a we went and filmed them, and then we were like, nah, we'll just do them digital, and then add like we had a we had a grain what do we call it a pixel screen layer? texture. We have a screen. Well, so when you when you zoom in really close to a screen, you can see the pixels, and they and they they affect the text in a certain way. They kind of break up the colors a little bit, so you have like chromatic aberration things like that, and well, so RGB split and all that stuff. Yeah, and the RGB split and that sort of thing. And so we were originally going to try to do every all the really close stuff practically, and we shot it, and it just was not matching as well, and it wasn't as crisp as we needed it to be. And so we ended up just going back and doing them all digitally, and then adding effects to make it look like we had done it practically. Which, and I remember whenever we would transfer stuff to color or effects, they would always lose the pixel layer. We'd be like, where's yes. the color? Yeah, because we would change contrast and you would lose it. Like, it was like, it was a lot. Okay, now I have some trivia for this episode that involves, I think, everyone, except maybe not Rob. I have more questions for you, though. Um, but this was the point in post and production where we were like, fuck it, we just got to start casting each other to get some of this stuff done. So Roxy has a cameo, a, vo a voice cameo in this. Tim has a voice cameo. I have a voice cameo. Lana has a hand cameo as a different character 
in this episode, which we filmed in the bathroom of the production office. <laughs> Mario has a beautiful cameo at the end. Oh yeah, I'm sitting literally right, th it is literally this shot, but it's darker and it's more red. And I'm wearing a, a Green Hornet mask that I got as a promo item uh, from the movie Green Hornet. And um, yeah, I'm like, I'm a gross, nasty person watching her get hacked up. In a wig. And I may or may not have done a voice cameo as a disgruntled middle-aged New York woman during... <laughs> I could buy that. <laughs> Wait, what? Where? Uh, do it now. Do it now. Do it, do it for us. Yeah, yeah. Is Janine coming uh, uh, back? Is, aren't, aren't you friends with him or something? Aren't you friends with him? <laughs> I didn't realize that was you. What? <laughs> Yeah, I, there, I had more than one, and Tim has one in there too. He goes, I, I think you're Zach. So there's the whole montage when she's at in Hacked, uh, taking orders, and it's like all these people being like, you know Zach Sullivan, you know Zach Sullivan, and uh, Tim has I also, one. I also, you saw my arm in that episode too. That's uh, true, I forgot. With the tattoo. Um, oh, for Zach? Yeah, uh, <laughs> the actor that was playing Zach Sullivan in that episode, uh, basically, they were filming him already doing those shots, and we didn't have time for Veronica to put the tattoo on him. So Mike is like, Tim, go see Veronica. He's, she's going to put the tattoo on you. So basically, you see my arm reaching out for the food, and uh, that was my acting debut as an arm model. <laughs> I think I'm in. Wow, we're all so multi-talented. I think I'm in like four or five episodes. You have a lot of, of <laughs> dark web. Uh, like Waldo, where's Waldo? Yeah, and and it's funny too because if you watch it and you and you find me every time that I like pop up, something terrible happens like within like <laughs> a couple seconds or minutes after. Um, so like, I know I definitely did like three or four different types of voices for those silly orders. And then also on the the train that me and Cassie and Hanu went and shot on a totally different shooting day. Um, oh, yeah. Where we, were, where we were on the L, and uh, you can catch me walking up behind her being a creep. And we, the other thing is, like, we shot this on a lot of different cameras. Roxy stuff was on the Alexa. You, Eric, you got yours on uh, All of mine was on a red until... Scarlet? Or which one? No, it was the dragon. The dragon. But it was, uh, it was until um, we did the reshoots, and then they were on the Ari, the Alexa. That's right. We went back to that. And then we have stuff shot on an iPhone in this episode. No, it's, uh, it's a GoPro. A GoPro. It's yeah, supposed to look like an iPhone. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Sorry, I can't remember. Or oh, you know any what? phone that has recording capabilities doesn't have to be Apple. Some of those... the webcam stuff with, was A7S on the Sony A7S. The webcam stuff. Oh, that's right. We had enough. Yeah. yeah. Oh my yeah. god. And then we had people at the end filming their stuff on the iPhone. They're like, Mario, you filmed yours on, or did you film it on iPhone? I think I just used the webcam. I might have my iPhone actually. Oh yeah, all the all the people who did the the like computer replacement, it was all pretty much iPhone or you know any other phone. I think it was just iPhone. <laughs> That's what I mean. We got to the point where, like this was getting towards the end of everything, and we're just like whatever it takes. Just film it. And yeah, then yeah, it especially for that, you know, like, you shoot for what you're trying to do, right? And and you know, rather than shoot a high quality video and then make it shitty to look like a webcam. Just shoot on an iPhone or shoot on a webcam and use that footage. Like, you know, it's why, why something that's just a, you know, a tiny part of a screen. Right. That's what, when we were shooting the, when I was shooting all of her phone stuff and I said I wanted to use the GoPro and most of it was for, for the idea of being able to get the shots that I was able to get where she like looks like she's putting it down or wherever she put it. Um, so it was mostly for like a space convenience thing. But at the end of the day, you know, Hanu was like, not exactly happy that I was shooting on a uh, GoPro and he was like I'll have nothing to do with this and he like gave me the GoPro so I was like okay fine like I had to do basically everything on the GoPro uh, because you know whatever but 
at the end of the day, it's like, okay, like this is supposed to be her phone. We're going to, we're going to put a filter over it anyway. And, you know, it works. And now I, I, I feel like I can catch so many things in TV and film that I'm like, oh, that was definitely not a, that was definitely a GoPro or that was definitely an A7S. You can just tell, especially with all the, the like flying capabilities these days they're not flying drag red dragons and in, in, in Aries. they're flying tiny cameras like the a7s and 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 you know the the gopros and and yes they might fly one of those big bodies every now and then but at the end of the day like why yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> no i love that like you have to maintain what is true to the project you know what i'm saying it's like i personally love mixed media and i love challenging that aspect because nowadays this is the world that we live in like we're we're always ingesting different forms of media and different types of formats like everyone's communicating through something different and as filmmakers it's our job to reflect the world that we're living in so obviously not everything's going to live in that like alexa 4k <laughs> sort of world yeah you know like all of my only fans they don't care about what camera i use Roxy, uh, the, mate, the mate you said, Madam A, she responded. <laughs> I have an Alexa app right here. <laughs> so, Roberto, what is, you know, now that this is done, what's your dream score to work on or to do? Uh, you know, I got into this industry because of Buffy, um, because oh, so funny. You all reference that. even though I was a kid, you know, John Williams, like, I feel like film scores were the first thing I heard. It wasn't until Chris Beck's stuff for Buffy that I realized, ooh, television score is a thing. And so as I, as I jumped into the industry, my goal has always been television over film. Not that I have anything against film, but I've loved the serialized nature of television, how, well, not anymore, but when there's 24 episodes in a season, you can take, like, themes for a character and build them over the course of the entire season as that character changes, um, instead of just having like an hour and a half or two hours of a movie and then they're gone. Um, so my goal is always, you know, to be able to score a series that just, that, that goes on for, a, you know, a decent amount of time. Um, because I think that that would be fun. Um, not even so much for the job security, but just for the, the fact that um, we could have so much fun with it. What are your top five favorite episodes of Buffy? Um, well, let's see, it's a good question. I, I guess the, the, more, the more Joyce dies, obviously, is like number one, the body, the body is number one. No, that, that one would be every single Spoiler. time. Spoiler! <laughs> um, the, where Buffy dies, the gift, um, I love, like, there's some, um, probably, like, Graduation Day Part 2, some of the, have you seen Buffy? Do you even know it? Okay. Me, um, the we are all hardcore Buffy fans. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm not, sorry. I'm oh, not, not a fan. I just, yeah. I, didn't watch, I didn't watch much TV until um, quarantine 2020. Oh I would let Sarah Michelle Gellar do dirty things to me. Oh. Tara, Tara's death in Seeing Red in, in season six. I feel like that season was weird right. when you first watched it, and then it's so dark that I really like it. The more I that love the floor with Felix so much. I just think it was such a yes, that episode was yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's you know like yeah, that's probably the, the you can't beat that. Yeah, it's a, I I would say I think that honestly some of the best scores of the past like five ten years have been out of TV. Like there's like um, like Leftovers had an amazing score. Oh, yeah, I was just listening to that today. Had an amazing score. Um, you know, I think it's really Ranger thing. iconic themes. Oh. I, I would also say, to be a total nerd about this, some of the best scores have been video games. There have been some really incredible scores, games coming out, like huge orchestras, really big composers, you know. Um, uh, the Final Fantasy remake. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly. yeah. War, Detroit. Breath of the Wild. Zelda, every Zelda yes, game yeah. ever. <laughs> um, uh, Horizons, you're doing Last of Us. Last of Us is yeah, Last of Us is awesome. Uh, like so, you know, there have been some really, I think, their composers have been moving into other types of media, and I think they pumped some really great stuff. Yeah, 
uh, the composer for Skyrim for Elder Scrolls. They yes. went on like a whole. They went on like a whole tour, and it looked yeah. amazing. Like I wanted to go. Yeah, for all nerds. For all nerds. Metroid Prime. For all nerds. We established good. So, but okay. So Lana, we want to make sure that we're addressing the the Espians. But also, we're watching this. What was it like uh, auditioning for? Because some people auditioned for this. Some people we just knew and we cast. Um, you auditioned for Molly and for Sam. So talk about like, you know, working with Roxy in the room and Russell, Boast, casting director. Yeah, um, I auditioned for Molly. Actually, Roxy, did you bring me in to audition for this or was it random? Oh, you did, okay. I assumed that, but I never asked you. Um, yeah, so I auditioned for Molly and then they were like, this isn't gonna work, get out. Oh, wait, try this other role. Um, I liked your Molly audition. I'm kidding, that's not what happened. Uh, no, you guys were like, oh, it, I think it was just you guys and Russell. It was Michael and Roxy and Russell, I believe, that first time. And then, no, wait, Michael, maybe, were you in my first one? The first time I oh, no, you weren't there. You know what? I remember because I hadn't met you yet, and I remember being in the waiting room, and you had to catch a flight because you walked out. And I, and you were like, good luck, everybody. And you were so nice. And I was like, I wonder who that was. And then I met you at the callback later. Uh, yeah, I had, to, I had like a, a producer session for the Vampire Diaries or something in Atlanta. So I had to fly home for that. Did you book it? No, I didn't. Which wanted to be a good thing because then it would have put delayed this a little or something. But this got delayed anyway, so it didn't matter. Anyway. Well, I remember thinking, oh, it's so nice. I wonder who that nice man is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, at the callback, I read for Sam and, um, yeah, I just, I remember, God, it was such a long time ago. I remember where it was and everything. I'm trying to remember specifics about the casting process in particular. I don't remember even which scene we did. Was it like, oh, it was probably with, um, uh, it was the attic scene. Oh, yeah. it was. Okay. The photo album stuff and, okay. Uh, yeah, so it was a dramatic scene. There's probably crying, I imagine. Um, yeah, it was, it's, you know, auditions are always so weird. It's like you're just sitting in this room with a bunch of people, many of whom you know. Like, there was a girl I hadn't seen since college. I was just like, oh my God, and we chatted for a while, and then sometimes, you know, there are people who are very serious, and people who are, like, just incessantly talking to you, and you're like, okay, I got it, let me just, you know, it's always, always fun, right. always interesting. <laughs> everybody's nervous, everybody's weird, um, myself included, so. Um, I love being in the casting, because I'm like, I have so much power. <laughs> I mean, honey, for you, because, like, you're usually auditioning, but, like, being able to sit in at a producer session and like being on the other side of the table, you know, what's that like? You think I would yeah. like it, but I mean, I learn a lot from it, but I get, I'm get incredibly nervous. I, uh, like, I don't know why I get really nervous for the people that come in and uh, I just get really nervous for them. And I'm, when they're performing, I'm, I, I want to like, I'm like, I don't want to get in their eye line. I don't know. I feel, I feel for them. I guess I, uh, empathize with them. I only sat in like one or two of those casting sessions and I felt exactly the same way. I felt like I should not be in this room. I felt like this is like super intimate and I'm this like weird person just watching them. I felt really uncomfortable but I was oh. And I want and it was so when we were filming viral it was terrible like there was a kissing <laughs> there was a kissing scene and I uh, had to like contain myself from laughing and I looked over and one of like the grips was like <laughs> It was just really awkward when you're not when you're in the scene acting, you're just in it and you don't even like notice everybody. But when you're I don't know, when I was watching, I was like, <gasps> Yeah, and it's I like get, you're being voyeuristic, right? Like you're a voyeur, you're watching everything. I am like, nervous for them and I want to make sure they're okay because I know it's like vulnerable, you know? Uh even weirder than like theatric or you know, TV film auditions. Commercial auditions sometimes are so weird. I can't tell you, there are three specific incidents I remember for various fast food chains where I literally had to walk into a room full of like six or seven advertising executives and eat an entire hamburger, say nothing. I just eat 
there's no dialogue. They just want to see what I look like eating a burger. Occasionally I can be like, hmm. Hey, it's like a mukbang. I feel like there's some people who would pay good money on the internet to watch it. <laughs> Probably. What's a mukbang? It's essentially, you know, on the internet, people uh, eat food on YouTube and, and other people watch. No. Oh. Oh. Okay, so yes, it's exactly that, except they're like casting you for something. But it's oh. so bizarre because, I mean, just as I wonder if it's even more weird for them watching because they're just like, I've just been watching. No, Lana, uh, like okay. watching someone eat is such an erotic thing and it's oh, such a fetish. Wow. fetish <laughs> it really I'll is. Watch mukbangs on YouTube. Yeah, you could totally just. I never they're thought you'd be into so it. Be into it. They, you know, you have people you love watching eat, and they, they, be, they get followers. Wow. This, this is why we all found each other. I don't like this, why. Why. this is how. No. But it's commercials. Are, I remember I took a commercial acting class, and the, they were teaching us how to eat. The teacher was teaching us how to eat a burger. And he was like, you know, make sure you taste it and then notice it. So he was like, Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> like you're surprised oh yeah and, and you're even more every bite you're like more like mm, mm, mm. <laughs> hey you remember uh i think it was day two of shooting we were at uh silver dream studio and we were doing the cafe scene and it was like you know hotter than a sauna in there and we had like gotten mcdonald's for everyone to eat in that particular yeah. scene Oh yeah, McDonald's fries are my favorite food, so that was the best day of my life because I ate them for like four hours straight. That was fun. Now, what was your favorite day? Of, I was just thinking it's of slow motion. Favorite day of filming? Yeah. yeah, what was your favorite day of filming? <sighs> and your least favorite, actually. You know, I don't, I, God, my memory is so bad. I remember the, when we, did we go back and pick up that last day or was it the last day when, when we were all on that, in that, um, what the heck was that, that, uh, like Double. mom's house. Yeah, yeah. Thousand Oaks. Yeah. We grabbed a bunch of stuff of you, of you digging through a cabinet and stuff. Okay, so it wasn't that, it was the day that we were all together, like, in, remember, like, when the, the catering lady and, like, just, every, it was, like, the middle of the night. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think that was just so fun because it wasn't often that we all got to be together. Um, like, I feel like a lot of the stuff we were kind of separated, you know, we'd be in pairs, but like, it was just um, Michael and Brian and Sibongle and I in the car just like having fun and it's the middle of the night. I remember it, my contact like had a tear in it and I remember I, my, I was like blind, I had to pull it out halfway through and I'm blind, I can't see anything. So I was trying to like adjust my eyes. So that whole day was a mixture of like, I don't know what's going on. I have no peripheral vision out of this side, but I'm also with my friends and it's like the last day. And it's, it was really very fun. I enjoyed that day a lot. I remember, I was going to say that was probably your, your least favorite day because you had that, the eye, the contact break. I remember that. Only because of that, but I loved the rest of it. I loved like it, it I can't, I'm trying to remember how many other days. We, oh, I guess there were a few days when we got to be together, but that one is just the most memorable to me because I just feel like so many, we had so many bits that came out of that night, just like funny things that happened that we still quote and reference. Oh, oh last wow. night. That was an oh. all night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were just like super caffeinated and giggly. It was very fun. I remember Roxy driving away in the morning and she, I was like, can she get home <laughs> And you stopped at a hotel to sleep, I think. You did? I did. I did. I feel like that night, oh my God, Michael, I was so stressed out that night. You remember how stressed out I was. I was like, we're not going to make it. The sun is coming up. And then like, I ended up, uh, I don't know how people got home that morning because there was major traffic on the 101. I ended up booking $50 for a motel just to sleep because I was so tired. And I know I would have gotten to an accident. Um, but yeah, it was really intense. I mean, God, it's like camp now that I think about it. It's so much fun and it's so intense. When was the last time we had something that intense, you know? Uh, like, coronavirus. <laughs> wah, wah, too soon! We only drink Mandela around these parts. Oh, that's good. Hello. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll start wrapping this up because I want to be uh, courteous of your time. But Eric, a couple more guys. So Eric, what 
tell us what were your inspirations like for the the visual aesthetic and everything for hat um well uh visually there's always uh gonna be uh my desire to do those long one take shots so um and that comes from my love from scorsese and uh just any filmmaker who has the balls to take a shot that lasts longer than a minute or longer than even 20 seconds really um and the other big inspiration i actually remember when we did the reshoots um and we had to shoot it all in the dark one of my biggest inspirations from that scene was silence of the lambs when uh they when she's looking for the killer in the dark essentially and i even remember us doing that shot where it's behind the mask and that was solely just from that um other than that you know a lot of the hacked is is just me i guess but if you watch it you might see elements of um uh like alex the ad he had told me there was a lot of hitchcock going on and um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I definitely saw some David Lynch stuff going on in my uh, in my end uh, kill room scene with the lighting and the music oh, and everything. I mean, that that scene to me is just like one of my favorites, even though it's so dark. But like at the same time, all the elements just, you know, once she gets kidnapped and then brought into basically a whole new world where like we go from this outside innocent world to holy shit, where is this girl? she's been kidnapped and she's in this dark world. And, and, and the reality is that she's, she's nowhere special, but the world is, you know, on the, on the screen and all these people watching her. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I've been in, inspired by plenty of different directors apparently, but most of it is just myself. I can only think of the one silence of the lambs things that I can actually call out and say, no, no, no I definitely wanted to mimic that or, or take inspiration from that. It's a Salbergian homage. It's an homage. Yeah, and just just like your yours is, you know, a, a Nardellian, and Mario's is a Michoni, and, and Roxy's is a oh, shit. I like the idea of, um, you know, us being directors of our own. Um, you know, we, 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 as much as we take inspiration from everything we see every single day, um, it's still, as a director, it comes from us, ideally. We're all very inspired by quarantine. Um, some hey, trivia. Michael, what was your la your favorite day? I'm curious of shooting. Um, your experience was different because you were wearing many hats, so I don't know if you got to just like enjoy it as much as the rest of the cast did. But I did. I was really nervous at the time about lots of things, but I'm like nostalgic for a lot of days now. Uh, definitely that day was. Well, that day was fun, but crazy. Um, uh, I liked when we were filming at Molly's house a lot because we were together there off screen. She was, um, knew me was there. And uh, uh, oh, Renee, yeah. Renee was there too. Renee was there and you had the, was it an ice cream truck or like a coffee yeah, truck? Ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. I feel like yeah. we were there for like- Nitro ice cream. Oh yeah. Nitro. That was good. Nitro. That was a good day. Nitro. So I like the Molly's house stuff. Um, I, I filming hack was fun because I had a lot of friends in that episode that I you know from like avenues of a lot of acting classes. <laughs> um, I don't know. So it was, it was all fun. I like Molly's house. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Filming at uh, Sid, uh, uh, Emerson was really cool. So felt like very sci-fi and imposing and all that stuff. How about your How about your party scene at my house? Yeah, that was fun. We'll talk. We're, that's funny. That's coming. That's in <laughs> one point one point seven. Okay. All right. Oh wait, is that was that? It was your place, right, Eric? Where we shot the pictures, the high school. Pictures? Yeah, we yeah. shot we shot the pictures there, and we also shot the um, party scene from Michael's. That was fun, actually. When we shot the prom photos, because that felt like a party. And you yeah, no, it was awesome because. Everybody just came to my house and looked all super sexy, and we all took some photos and were drinking some wine. It was, it was so great. fun. Making a comedy, even though it was dark web. <laughs> yeah, Michael had a crazy wig, and it was so funny. <laughs> I wore my actual prom dress. Michael and Mario and Tim for season two. Can we play up the comedy darkness? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Going back to wig. We have lots of funny people. <laughs> 
because I feel like there was there were so many funny funny parts in dark web that we could have amplified on you know well the beauty of the the web I guess is that it is hilarious the web is also hilarious and there's a lot of people who find some sick twisted comedy in this dark stuff yeah I think there could be more levity especially if it's like takes place uh in the 90s there yeah because our scooby like I feel like oh my god like the anthologies themselves are super dark but there was so much fun between the gang you know and if they go for too far back you'll have to recast us That's fine. Just cast all those people you blurred out in the we'll, photo. We'll, no, we'll work oh. to the in the 90s also. Yeah, we can't. We need I'll get some work done. Yeah, me too. I'm ready. I'm ready. You know, when I was doing that, uh, editing that prom, uh, prom photo, uh, you, I remember you had asked me to remove your scruffy hair and. I did not. Yes, and that was labor intensive. To Are you remember. talking about Michael? Yeah, I'm talk- yeah, of course I'm talking about Michael. <laughs> okay. I thought you were talking about her. Lana thought you were talking no, about- no, not Lana. You are talking about Lana's five o'clock shadow. <laughs> and Lana had fake bangs on that day, and she was wearing her actual yeah. prom, her real prom dress. <laughs> Fun bangs. All right, All right. so. Uh, yeah. Mike and uh, Brian in that photo. We did what? I had to de-age everyone in that yeah, photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He always talks about how hard it was to de-age me. Come de-age? on. De-age? What? Did you really? He did. We took away my, like, scruff, and he probably took away, like, crow feet or something. I don't oh, know. my God, Michael. You look 15. Stop. I mean, look at that skin, girl. Like. You're glowing. Not You're not glowing like. face. Um, so now's the time where it's, uh, we, I, I ask knowing that we're all in quarantine so the it's a loaded question, but Rob, what are you working on now and what's coming next? Um, so I, I finished up a feature about a month ago. Um, but I actually have, um, an audio fiction podcast that I wrote, directed, and did all of post on and I recorded the actors last in June last year and so through the fall so I actually had time to sit down and finish all the audio editing all of the sound design all the score ironically by the time I got to the score I was like oh fuck am I done can I be done I mean want to score this I just want to be finished because it's been so long um so I'm I'm finishing that up and like the trailer and figuring out like launching that so where uh, where will we be able to see that, or where can people? See um, well, it'll so it's audio only, um, and it's it's serialized. It's about a guy who doesn't believe in dinosaurs and travels back in time to prove they don't exist. Um, and obviously, he's wrong. It's kind of an action comedy. It will it will it's a podcast. It will be it allow us to be up through iTunes, but we're pitching it to larger podcast companies too. So Allison's got a pitch deck um, prepped. Um, and we get the trailer ready and, um, but ultimately we'll be up one way or another. Okay, cool. Well, let us know. Okay. Yeah. I want to hear, I like, uh, I like story podcasts in addition to like all the news, but, but I like the story, you know? Yeah. And you're also like a talented chef of tacos, right? Uh, well, I could get on Instagram. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I, have a, I used to have a podcast, but I have a book called Taco City about tacos in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, it's like the 70 places that you should go and what you should eat if you get there. Um, but I cook for fun. Cooking is like my procrastination tool when I'm writing music and I'm blocked. Then I'm like, oh shit, I don't, I don't know what to write for this scene. Oh, I'll, I'm gonna go cook. And then I'll go like make something or make like a sauce or, or start cooking. And then my brain will switch. And I'll go, oh, I totally know what to write for that scene. And then I'll come running back in like write the music. It's a nice like, it's like people run, some people run, some people go for a drive. Yeah. Isn't it so interesting? I was just having a conversation with a singer songwriter about this, how like disruption or like doing something, like procrastination should be eliminated from the creator's vocabulary. Because like, like procrastination is us doing other things to unblock our creativity and to make us more effective actually. So 
everyone's so attached or like so sorry I'm like going off of this thing but like attached to a certain way of doing things or like an artist process or like your certain way of process but right. like as we evolve it's so obvious that like we often need disruption in order to um find connect with our intuition or like unblock that thing that we were seeking yeah it's got such a negative connotation to it in like every other job but really it's part of the job like it took me years to to kind of reconcile that and not feel guilty about because you're working when you're not working because sometimes I'm working stuff out and I'm like oh if I put these use these instruments in this scene and this and so by the time I sit down like my brain has already figured out a lot of the work yep. when I was like washing the dishes or walking the dog or whatever you're working in the background yes the process <laughs> of the world. Um, well, that's very cool. So you're, everybody here wears so many different hats. Um, Lena, Lana, what are you working? You just did a, what'd you just film? What'd you just do? I shot a commercial this week. Um, you'll see it next month. For? Presumably. I cannot say, but it'll be fun. It's for Apple. Um, no. Um. For Disney. But it was a weird socially distant shoot and uh, I immediately got a COVID-19 test, although then I heard that you have to wait a few days, so I guess I have to go get another one. Yeah. But I tested negative, so that was good. Anyway, um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I've had it done. Did you get a nasal? No, I thought it was the nasal one. That's what it said in my like email that said what to prepare, but then it was the mouth swab yeah. one. The thing with the mouth one that was so funny for me, because I, I wanted to go visit my mom, but I wanted to make sure I was negative before I did that. I went to go do one of those drive through ones and he like walks you through it and they're all very serious and all precautions and sitting in my car scrubbing and he goes, scrub until I tell you to stop. Ew. Like two minutes of rubbing my mouth with this Q-tip and I was like, can I, like this is so weird. I think like, I just kept looking at him and then, okay, keep going. Maybe he has... Moco Topo? What is it called? Yeah. That's where you watch people eat? Maybe he liked you. It's like the oh. longest mouth swab of my life. Yeah, it's supposed to be 20 seconds, so I think yeah. he was messing with you. So long. He was being extra thorough. It's like a mukbang, but with mukbang. like mouth swab. Yeah. But... It's like, uh, like delivery. Yeah, it's bliss. <laughs> no. I think like um, I was taking advantage of, maybe. I think I so, because it's there are lines everywhere that say 20 seconds. <laughs> charge people for watching. I keep getting the mouth one. I keep getting the nose one. It hurts. They stick it in your brain. It looks awful, the nose one. Oh, you, oh honey, yeah. you could get the mouth swab one. Just apply now for the uh, drive-in one. The yeah, you can drive up. And it was pretty easy. The whole thing was 30 minutes from, yeah, uh, 40 minutes from the time I pulled in to the time I left. It was, they, is it same day, like rapid test? It was, I, it was one day. Yeah, they told Everyone me. Everyone should go get tested. Seriously, everybody. It's yeah, free yeah, in Los Angeles. Yeah. Go get tested. When I was last month, it, was, it took a week. It took a week to get the results back. And they were like, here you go. You're negative. And I was like, yeah, but I had to go to Trader Joe's between like last week and this week. So wow. it doesn't matter anymore. Right. They told me it was going to take a week and it took, it took only a day. Because um, I, I was the same way. I was like, what's the point of getting a test? I'm waiting a week and I go to a store and I pick it there and then I'm not negative anymore. But, but then you know you didn't infect anyone at the store, so that's good. Right, true. Does anybody have antibodies? Positive. No. I, I haven't taken that test. But isn't that test, like, not, like, accurate? Who I knows? heard one out of three yeah. every, every week it changes, so who knows? Right. Yes, no, tomorrow, yes, Wednesday, maybe, and Friday, no again. <laughs> true. Yeah, I think I'm just, anytime I'm going to be around people, because I'm never around people, I've been very uh i'm a little bit of a hypochondriac during all of this like yeah. every yesterday i started to get a little like hmm, my throat feels funny i'm like oh my god yeah. this is the end um <laughs> I, I made a will and anyway i'm negative so it's okay but you never know you're negative I'm transitioning you're back's gonna be a bitch what is okay. transitioning back oh yeah 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 i mean you you didn't lana but like it's hard already like i am actually fine if I could somehow just find work and development for the rest of the year like I <laughs> don't know how I feel about shooting yeah. yeah it's it's hard I mean especially if you're indoors and 
all of the crew are wearing masks and you're able to stay apart and it's a skeleton crew, I think it's okay. And if it's like one actor to a camera, but like if you're doing scenes, the actors obviously can't be wearing masks. So that's not safe. And then like, you know, I don't know, just everything is it, you know, you, they make up and hair people like they couldn't even, I had to do it myself which is fine, except that then in between takes when I'm like, do I look shiny? And they're like, oh yeah, you do. Like, okay, I have to sanitize my hands and then like get my stuff, you know, like do, I'm like, am I still okay? You know, this is all stuff that like ordinarily these jobs belong to multiple people, but you're just constantly, I must have used like a full tub of hand sanitizer that the dick, I was just terrified. I was like, I don't, I don't want to accidentally touch my face or, you know, whatever. And be, uh, it's all, it's, it's very scary, new, but new normal. I, you know, I want to be on like Criminal Minds. I heard they're buying a robot that like cleans every, goes in and just blast, laser blast every set. <laughs> like it's like some insanely expensive robot that will is on wheels and goes and just kills the bugs. Well, let me ask you yeah. guys this: Is that like with these precautions now, like it'll be harder for indie filmmakers to make their stuff right yes and no tell me more well i have a friend who's getting ready to shoot something uh yes to do it right and and safely but no in the sense that i don't know are there still limits on how many people you can have gathered in california because her whole thing was like i can shoot this whenever i want we're only, it's like a 10 person crew and only a couple actors. So we don't have, we don't have to worry about the limits of like how many people you can have gathered. What about the tests though? Cause I have a friend producing stuff who was saying everyone has to be tested every day and he was calculating what the cost of that would be. And he's just oh, saying, I is that like a man, is that law that they have to get, or is that just, they're taking that on? I don't know. And it's not, it wasn't in California. So it could be wherever he's trying to shoot, but he was like, this makes indie production impossible because just paying for tests for people is already the budget. Yeah. If that's like a mandate by, I don't know that like this production I'm talking about was planning on that. I think they were just looking at like the, the, uh, how many people you can have and they were like well if other you know bigger s productions probably can't start yet but we can because we only have you know a skeleton crew and one actor but then do, so. do those people feel safe like yeah. without being probably not, probably not. Indie, indie indie filmmakers will find a way as they always have grin and barrett i guess i don't know but the actors are the only ones that have to have the mask off Hi. yeah but yeah, I don't know. You know, I think I would probably, if I were, if I was doing a short, I would maybe feel comfortable if I knew that everyone had gotten a test like within that week and we're all negative, yeah. you know, and, and had since that negative test, you know, done social distancing and kind of camped out and stayed at home and that sort of thing. I wouldn't yeah. feel super com comfortable if everyone was like, oh, I went to all these restaurants and stores, you know, between my tests and that. But like, you know, for me, I'm more concerned about being a carrier than I'm about getting sick myself. Like, I just don't want to inadvertently get someone who's vulnerable sick. And so that's why I'm very much like, if I'm going to go visit my mom, I'm going to go get tested before, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's just a very strange kind of, you know, it's weird to like worry, like when I go get the mail, like, oh, I should probably go get gloves because, you know, someone in my building has it, you know, like, like it's, it's a weird thing to kind of think about all the time. And then you forget, like I saw a meme, like you like walk out and you realize you forgot your mask and you're like, God damn. Yeah, I, so, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> I'm like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> whoops. You know, it's going to be interesting to see like how people readjust you know, back in society, uh, especially when the vaccine comes out. I mean, uh, I see people are already like going back to the gyms, but they have like all these like face shields, the mask, and it's like, you know, why? Like, like, yeah, restri restrict your breathing while you're working out. It'll do great for you. Yeah, I just suspended my gym membership for that very reason. They were like, um, oh, don't worry, it's sick. You have to wear masks at the entrance and exit. And I was like, but you don't have to wear them when you're working out. They're like, oh, well, no, that's not safe. And I was like, hello? I, I agree with you, but like- But well, you're breathing the hardest. You're yeah, breathing. exactly, you're expelling, and they're like, oh, no, no, but every other treadmill is out of service. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can just go like, <sighs> and you know, that's gonna go everywhere. So like, 
Hey, you know, uh, the gym where I go to, uh, I mean, they reopen, but I was telling my trainer, you know, the fact that they reopen, it's great. And I'm glad everybody, you know, has their jobs back. But, you know, as far as going in there and training, I just don't feel comfortable just because besides the fact there's no vaccine yet, people don't, you know, wipe down the furniture or the equipment. And you don't do it anyway. And now that we're expecting everyone to like suddenly do it, like it's just, you, you can't yeah, to not be pigs. Exactly. I mean, people weren't doing it before the coronavirus and people are, are sure as heck not going to be doing that while the coronavirus is going on. It's like, why are you putting yourself at risk? But then again, if you're exercising your healthy bodies, you might have a higher immunity. I, don't, I, heard, I, heard, I heard my dad it, and his doctor told him that if you feel sick, you should stop exerting and working out because it actually takes it takes Yeah. It, it makes it harder on your body to fight the virus. Listen, I don't know about y'all, but let me just tell you, your at-home workouts and pull-ups and push-ups, they'll get you in the best shape of your life anyway. Yeah, so. They're rough. Just uh, just do pull-ups. And if you can't do more than 10, then don't worry about the gym. <laughs> um, all right. So, Eric, so Lana just did a commercial. Congratulations. Thanks. Eric, what are you working on next? Uh, I'm just working on finishing my second feature script. Um, and, you know, right in a way and finally meeting some possible investors. Lovely. Over Zoom, we hope. Yes, absolutely. Claim this was your third Zoom. I don't know if we believe you. You haven't been doing anything you should have. What? Uh, nothing. It's a, Tim always says that to me. It's a line from a movie. Oh, puppy! Look, Look at, at the clothes. Oh. Huge. She hates me. <laughs> She's growling so much right now. I'm calling. Give me Peter. that wine, Mama. Give me that wine. <laughs> um, okay, so and then Mario, Roxy, Tim, do you want to talk? We talked about it last week, but you want to talk? Yeah, about we. It's all. It's all more or less the same. I, I do think so, um, to to Rob's point, I have been kind of thinking about quarantine specific things that you can do, and I've kind of been toying with doing a narrative podcast myself because i feel like that's something i can you can do in quarantine like i can task you know friends and actors i know all over to record their parts individually send them to me i could build it here you know yeah right exactly Lana. i have a couple ideas that i think could kind of fit in that format so you'll all be hearing from me all right we better if we don't i'm so proud of you that is totally something that i see you doing <laughs> <laughs> so okay anybody else have any questions comments last words before we close out building the dark web 1.2 round table discussion um, nope. i i just want to say that i can't wait for season two and did you announce it yet no not yet uh, not yet not yet not officially fingers crossed but we're working on we're working on yeah, that. Yeah. and we're, we're hoping to take home some gold too i know i'm so excited i'm sitting amongst so many emmy nominees it's very daunting Ooh. and uh uh roberto is allison gonna join us on one of these i'm gonna invite her obviously but hopefully yeah yeah she that would be lovely allison won the emmy allison is both our collaborator and our competitor this year at the emmys Yes, for forever. Yes, and she won last year. So they won at the Indie Series Awards last night. They won best show, best director, best show on what? Best production design. The Indie Series Awards. I didn't know. The, 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 yeah, they've been around for like nine years, ten years, and it's a lot. It's a lot of soap actors. It's it's um. Well, she'd be better at telling you because I'm not the one who has to submit, but I've been to them multiple times over the years. Um, they're great. They're, they did a virtual show, which was like had to have been terrifying because they put it together in two weeks and they had like every presenter show up on the screen. Okay. And they were like, the nominees are, and the nominees would pop up on the screen and the winner would give a speech. Um, I think they got literally got somebody from Zoom to like help them, yeah, switch back and forth. Thank God for Zoom, because, you know, other uh, conferencing things have not been as reliable as Zoom <laughs> in the past. 
Wait, is that what they're doing for the Emmys? Is it going to be like this? So uh, for Emmys, they're going to have a live telecast next Friday on CBS for some of the category for best digital drama series. And then there may be some other ones. And then right after that on social media, they're going to announce some of our crossover categories, I think so far as with like, uh, like music. Um, and well, let me, let, let, I'll say, let me, let's actually, Allison told me that they were going to do that at the separate, they weren't going to announce them, but they were going to do them at the separate ceremony. Well, the, the, the July 19th one. I'll, I'll give you, I'm going to give you all the tea. Let me stop recording. Yes. Bye everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. Be well and be safe everyone. Now I got to pour some.